Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the 15-Minute Devotional Program. This is an online video and podcast series for Akron Alliance Fellowship Church and for Melvin Gaines' Faith Channel. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. My name is Melvin Gaines. This program will always continue to emphasize the importance of everyone to get into God's Word and stay in God's Word as we learn and grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to cover the two-year Bible plan reading for Wednesday, August the 21st, 2024. Um, our church, Akron Alliance Fellowship Church, encourages participation in the two-year Bible reading plan, which allows for the reader to go through the entire Bible over a two-year period. In this particular program, we're going to be covering the passages for today with a brief commentary. This will take about 30 minutes or less of time. But when you personally participate in the two-year Bible reading plan, it's going to encompass the amount of time of reading the passages, which will be about 7 to 10 minutes a day followed by an additional five to eight minutes of time of reflection and prayer over what you've read. If you add those numbers up, that comes to 15 minutes. That's why we call the program the 15-minute devotional. And the hope is that you will establish great habits of study by getting into the Word and staying in the Word every single day. And we think that the two-year Bible reading plan, uh, covering that 15-minute time frame, is the way for you to be successful in covering that entire Bible. And before you know it, you'll go through two years and you've read the entire Bible. We appreciate you participating in this program and asking you to, we're asking you also to spread the word and let people know that this program is out there to uh, encourage people to get in the word. And it only takes a small amount of your time if you have a very busy schedule. You can get copies of the two-year Bible reading plan by going to our website, akronalliance.org. That's all one word, akronalliance.org. Clicking on the links tab and then selecting the tab it says two-year Bible reading plan. You'll get downloadable copies of the uh, Bible plan. And we also encourage you to go to our website, my website, melvingaines.com, for additional content uh, uh, to our programming on Melvin Gaines' Faith Channel, as well as links to sermons and all kinds of information that helps you to get closer and closer in your relationship with Jesus Christ. We appreciate you being here. Uh, let's go ahead and just reveal the passages for today. For Wednesday, August 21st, we're going to be reading through Jeremiah chapter 50, verses 21 through 46, Titus uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 16, uh, Psalm 97, verses 1 through 12, and Proverbs 21, verses 25 and 26. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's go ahead and look to the Lord with a word of prayer and we'll get started. Lord, we indeed are thankful for your presence and we thank you, Lord, for now helping us to learn and understand through the power of the Spirit what we're reading and gain greater wisdom and understanding from you. Lord, we want your wisdom. We want to know exactly what you would have us to know about what we're reading and understanding. And we give you praise and thanks for your presence at this time. Bless us and keep us, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, everyone, let's turn your Bibles and electronic devices to our first passage for today. It's going to be Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah 50, and we're going to cover verses 21 through 46. Now we're picking up, as you might have surmised, when we do the two-year uh, two Bible reading plan, you're going to wind up going through a passage and it'll stop at a certain point and you'll pick up the next day. You really won't lose any flow. The, the way that the program is designed, uh, the two-year Bible plan is, is designed is to give you trains of thought that will help you through uh, day after day. You, don't, you won't necessarily miss out on anything. Uh, but in this particular situation, this uh, area, chapters 50 and 51, uh, God reveals to Jeremiah this prophecy about uh, Babylon. Babylon is a very important area in, in Scripture. There's a lot of references to Babylon in the Old Testament, also in the New Testament. And to summarize, we're talking about a land that God had appointed to go and, frankly, pronounce judgment on uh, Jerusalem and Judah and put them into captivity, uh, essentially with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who was in charge of Babylon at the time. But Babylon itself, because it was not following the Lord, uh, God will use different mechanisms to proclaim judgment against um, his people, his own people, and that's going to be the Jews and Jerusalem and Judah, but 
At the end of the day, there's also a prophecy about Babylon. It has its own sordid history of not being obedient to the Lord. So I'm going to read the passage and then we'll, I think, pretty much cover the summary at the beginning here as to what we're going to be reading. But let's go ahead and look at this, uh, starting at verse 21. We read from the New Living Translation. I'll read the passage and we'll follow up from there. Chapter 50, Jeremiah, verse 21. Go up, my warriors, against the land of Marathaim and against the people of Pecod. Pursue, kill, and completely destroy them as I have commanded you, says the Lord. Let the battle cry be heard in the land, a shout of great destruction. Verse 23, Babylon, the mightiest hammer in all the earth, lies broken and shattered. Babylon is desolate among the nations. Listen, Babylon, for I have set a trap for you. You are caught, for you have fought against the Lord. The Lord has opened his armory and brought out weapons to vent his fury. The terror that falls upon the Babylonians will be the work of the sovereign Lord of heaven's armies. Yes, come against her from distant lands, break open her granaries, crush her walls and houses into heaps of rubble, destroy her completely and leave nothing. Destroy even her young bulls. It will be terrible for them, too. Slaughter them all, for Babylon's day of reckoning has come. Verse 28. Listen to the people who have escaped from Babylon as they tell in Jerusalem how the Lord our God has taken vengeance against those who destroyed his temple. Send out a call for archers to come to Babylon. Surround the city so no one, none can escape. Do to her as she has done to others, for she has defiled the Lord the Holy One of Israel. Her young men will fall in the streets and die. Her soldiers will all be killed, says the Lord. Verse 31, See, I am your enemy, you arrogant people, says the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies. Your day of reckoning has arrived, the day when I will punish you. O land of arrogance, you will stumble and fall, and no one will raise you up. For I will light a fire in the cities of Babylon that will burn up everything around them. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. The people of Israel and Judah have been wronged. Their captors hold them and refuse to let them go. But the one who redeems them is strong. His name is the Lord of heaven's armies. He will defend them and give them rest again in Israel. But for the people of Babylon, there will be no rest. The sword of destruction will strike the Babylonians, says the Lord. It will strike the people of Babylon, her officials and wise men too. The sword will strike her wise counselors, and they will become fools. The sword will strike her mightiest warriors, and panic will seize them. The sword will strike her horses and chariots and her allies from other lands, and they will all become like women. The sword will strike her treasures, and they, will all, they all will be plundered. Verse 38, a drought will strike her water supply, causing it to dry up. And why? because the whole land is filled with idols and the, and the people are madly in love with them. Soon Babylon will be inhabited by desert animals and hyenas. It will be a home for owls. Never again will people live there. It will lie desolate forever. I will destroy it as I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, says the Lord. No one will live there. No one will inhabit it. Look, a great army is coming from the north. A great nation and many kings are rising against you from far off lands. They are armed with bows and spears. They are cruel and show no mercy. As they ride forward on horses, they sound like a roaring sea. They are coming in battle formation, planning to destroy you, Babylon. The king of Babylon has heard reports about the enemy and he is weak with fright. Pangs of anguish have gripped him like those of a woman in labor. I will come like a lion from the thickets of the Jordan leaping on the sheep in the pasture. I will chase Babylon from its land and I will appoint the leader of my choice for who is like me and who can challenge me? What ruler can oppose my will? Verse 45, listen to the Lord's plans against Babylon and the land of the Babylonians. Even the little chicken will be dragged off like sheep and their homes will be destroyed. The earth will shake with a shout, Babylon has been taken and its cry of despair will be heard around the world. All right, this is the prophecy that was given. Uh, at the time, uh, Babylon was indeed the, um, the, one of the greatest places on earth uh, when we're reading about this and looking at this. 
And where was Babylon? Babylon was like a city-state located on, on the banks of the Euphrates River in what would be now uh, known as uh, southern Iraq in that particular area. But that town does not exist. It does not exist. It's just as biblical prophecy has mentioned, we just don't have time to get into the references of uh, Babylon in the New Testament, but we're not really talking about an actual place. We're talking about more of a culture and a lifestyle because Babylon historically has never really followed God. It never has had a reason to. That was the place where we had the original Tower of Babel uh, that took place. We're referring to Nimrod, um, who was the one who was one of the first settlers in that area, who was a great and mighty warrior. And we have to recognize that at the end of the day, they never followed God. They always were opposed to God. And God does indeed use those places uh, in in his history, uh, re referencing the the uh, way we read in the Old Testament, how he'll use lands where who are not following God to actually pronounce judgment, as I had mentioned, on the ones who are supposed to be following God, which are the Jews, the Jewish nation. And that's exactly what took place. But Babylon's end came uh, during the reign of King Cyrus. And what King Cyrus actually did to take, to capture Babylon, when it, remember what it says about drying up the rivers uh, in the passage? I have to go back and find that now. I, I saw it and I probably went uh, didn't really reference it very well oh uh, a drought will that's verse 38 a drought will strike her water supply causing it to dry up that's because Cyrus actually found a way to drain the rivers that were flowing through Babylon so that they could literally walk into the city on the dry riverbeds and capture that city and uh, basically do it in and so that was interesting to, to see that but we see how prophetically this is stating how this whole thing took place God is a God who will declare his word and keep it. And it's not so much about uh, whether or not he will do it, because he will do it. We just don't know always the timing of those things. But here, this was done during the reign of King Cyrus. And we recognize that they are never again going to live there. People are not going to be living in that area. It is desolate. And to this day, just as God said he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah in the same manner, there is no Sodom and Gomorrah that is in existence. There's nothing that has replaced it or taken its place. Very awesome words coming from God. He is a God who keeps his promises. He is a God who delivers. And he is a God who is faithful. He is not going to reward Babylon for what they did when they were uh, prophetically uh, stated that they would uh, destroy Jerusalem and tear it down and... 586, 587, 586 BC, um, 586 AD, excuse me. Um, he was not going to BC. I didn't want to say it correctly. It's BC. I'm sorry about that. Um, always want to make a correction uh, to make sure I'm doing it right. This is before the time of Christ, obviously. So we're recognizing that God indeed is a God of just justice. He is going to uh, fulfill the prophecy. He's going to make the declaration, the statement of that, of those things as well, too. So I just wanted you to make a note of that. If you want to do some additional research about Babylon, and you can just do a search uh, for Babylon and what that represents and what it stands for. But at the end of the day, uh, we're talking about a culture, a people. Babylon, uh, the word Babel, where it comes from, means confusion. Who's the author of confusion? Satan is. That's essentially why we have the name, and that's what we refer to Babylon for what it is, and that's why it's significant when it comes to the Old Testament prophecy and also significant in the end time prophecy as well, too. The name of Babylon. Let's go to Titus chapter 1. Thank you for bearing with me there. I'm going to be so careful about getting things the right way, and I'll, I'll even make a mistake in the process of saying something. So, But thank you for your patience. Titus chapter 1, let's look at verses 4 through 16. And we've got... A pretty important passage here because it's actually going to be a passage that actually talks about the qualifications of an elder uh, within this very reading. So let's go ahead and look at this. Titus chapter 1, Titus 1, starting at verse 4. Let's, let's go ahead and read it now. I am writing to Titus, my true son in the faith. This is Paul writing. That uh, true son in the faith that we share, may God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior give you grace and peace. I left you on the island of Crete so you could complete your our work there and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. 
An elder must live a blameless life. He must be faithful to his wife and his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker, violent or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having a guest in his home and he must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong. Verse 10, for there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. Verse 11, they must be silenced because they are turning the whole families away from the truth by their false teaching, and they do it only for money. Even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete, has said about them, the people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. Verse 13, this is true. So reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. They must stop listening to Jewish myths and the commands of people who have turned away from the truth. Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who's, who's are, who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupted. Such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They are detestable and disobedient worthless for doing anything good. All right, that's the reading for Titus chapter 1, verses 4 through 16. First, early on in the passage we read, we saw the qualifications um, for an elder and what, what uh, Paul was uh, teaching Titus when, when he left him on Crete was to go and find elders. Go find elders and people who would be responsible for churches or leadership within the church. And essentially, when we look at the section... Uh, following uh, verse 6, um, these are the qualifications that are used today to determine if, for example, a church was looking for a pastor or a new pastor, let's say one was retiring, and they were looking for a new pastor, they would put out the qualifications uh, as if uh, they were doing a listing on Indeed or whatever it is, uh, <laughs> to, and they'll reference sometimes uh, the passage here in Titus chapter 1, verse 6, about... Uh, and verses six and seven, these are the qualifications for an elder. A blameless life, a person who lives a blameless life, a person who's faithful to his wife and children, and a person who doesn't have a reputation for being a wild person or rebellious. I think that's a pretty good qualification for someone who is in church leadership. A blameless life, can't be arrogant, can't be quick-tempered. You can't be a heavy drinker. Um, it's interesting that they reference heavy drinker uh, uh, you know, Timothy had to sometimes have wine because he had a weak stomach, right, to help to try to soothe his stomach. So drinking was not forbidden back then, but certainly he couldn't be a wild drunk or something like that or a person who was dishonest with money. And he's got to be a person who lives a good, quiet life. And he's disciplined. And he is always striving to learn more, even in the faith. That's what a pastor, that's what an elder should be like. Uh, in leadership in a church. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the things that were mentioned here at the end of this passage and that we read about in Titus chapter 1. Um, there was still a lot of false teaching taking place, and uh, Paul was warning um, uh, Titus about this and talking about the people who were on the very island that he was on, the Cretes being lazy and just not really their animals or gluttons they were they were pretty um they weren't acting right they weren't living the right way and at the end of the day um to, you know paul when he traveled titus timothy they did mission work they did missionary work they went from place to place to do what to teach the people about how to live and of course in this particular situation paul is giving the warning to titus to make sure that their false teachers do not get a foothold. They're still going to insist the importance of circumcision as being necessary for salvation when, in fact, um, the teaching to the Gentiles never talks about circumcision. If anything, they talk about not circumcision as far as the body is concerned, but circumcision of the heart. That's what's most important uh, to be a believer in Jesus Christ. 
But this false teaching about the Jewish myths that are turning people away from the truth, that is something that needs to be put down right away and, and make sure that these people are corrected and making sure that they're being taught the right way so that they stop teaching the wrong way. And so we have to recognize that there are some people, and this, this goes back to what it says in verse 16, the people who are proclaiming to know the truth, they really don't know the truth. Verse 16, such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They are detestable and disobedient, worthless for doing anything good. I hope we can see that, you know, this even applies today to this age where we have people who profess to know God and they'll know him in maybe even some spiritual way that's even greater, some sort of a mystic way uh, to get attention. And they'll do it for money. They'll do it for their own profit, their own gain. We need to avoid these people like a plague. We need to have discernment to make sure that whoever we're following is actually teaching the true and proper word of God and not misrepresenting it in any way, shape, or form. That's the challenge that we have as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we encourage others with our own, uh, the own words of good news and encouragement, may we always uh, provide resources to other people that will not lead them astray or had lead them to follow someone who is not teaching correctly. We need to do our own homework on this and we need to vet these people before we recommend them to someone else. Just because it's a famous name doesn't mean it's a good name. Just giving you a, a food for thought. I'm not going to mention any names. I'm going to let you uh, discern who is proper and who you can recommend because I think that at the end of the day that's what we need to be doing as believers. Amen. Let's go to Psalm 97. You're welcome to ask questions about anything that I've mentioned here as well too and you can put that in the comments we are on the youtube channel um as as far as it, where we're going to be doing this particular platform and we, are, we encourage you to uh like and to subscribe uh, on the akron alliance fellowship youtube channel so you can get notifications for all new content that we post we post content every sunday and wednesday on this channel that's my little commercial. Let's go to Psalm 97. Let's look at verses 1 through 12. This is the entire uh, section of Psalm 97. And this is a song of praise. I believe Psalms 95 through 99 are all uh, praiseworthy psalms or hymns. Um, let's uh, call them what they are. They're hymns. This particular one is actually going to be talking about Christ's second coming to earth. So let's read through Psalm 97 verses 1 through 12. The Lord is king, let the earth rejoice. <clears throat> let the farthest coastlands be glad. Dark clouds surround him, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire spreads ahead of him and burns up all his foes. His lightning flashes out across the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness. Every nation sees his glory. Those who worship idols are disgraced. All who brag about their worthless gods. For every god must bow to him. Verse 8. Jerusalem has heard and rejoiced. And all the towns of Judah are glad because of your justice, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are supreme over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord hate evil. He protects the lives of his godly people and rescues them from the power of the wicked. Light shines on the godly and joy on those whose hearts are right. May all who are godly rejoice in the Lord and praise his holy name. Okay, that's a psalm of praise, isn't it? Now there is one section here I want to look at very quickly. Back at verse 7, I'll read the passage again really quick in Psalm 97 verse 7. Those who worship idols are disgraced, all who brag about their worthless gods, for every god must bow to him. Now, gods, I, the proper use of this should be translated angels. And there, you can go back and look at Hebrews 1.6. Uh, I'll just read it for you. You don't need to turn to it. But it re reads in Hebrews 1.6, And when he brought his supreme son, being Jesus Christ, into the world, God said, Let all of God's angels worship him and what we have a tendency to do um, as human beings in the flesh we just like the romans did back in the day when they had the pantheon they would put these gods different gods they worship on a shelf 
and they were all worthless. They didn't have any, they weren't alive, they weren't living gods. And at the end of the day, I think for our context and what we're looking at here, these worthless gods could very well be gods, but I think for the context of this thing here, we're not worshiping angels, we're not worshiping created beings, amen? And remember that Satan is a created being because that's Lucifer, that's the fallen angel, Lucifer, a created being. We don't waste our time worshiping those things that are created beings. We want to make recognize that every god has to buy every god being these angels whoever we elevate to be a god ultimately responds and re reports directly back to god himself the one who created them so that's kind of a tricky passage to look at we just wanted to make sure that we were looking at the context of it um we don't need to be worshiping those things that are inanimate amen we need to be worshiping uh, god himself who is alive who is living and he is presiding over everything that's going on. He knows the heart of every person. And he knows those who truly are uh, desiring to follow him and trust in him. Let's go to Proverbs for the final passage for today. Proverbs 21. We're going to look at verses 25 and 26. Proverbs 21, verses 25 and 26. As we usually read in the Proverbs, they are very straightforward. There's really nothing... Um, here that's difficult to understand uh, at the end of the day uh, we're looking at something that's pretty obvious when we look at proverbs so if we read verses 25 and 26 proverbs 21 verse 25 despite their desires the lazy will come to ruin for their hands refuse to work some people are always greedy for more but the godly love to give Interesting passage. Remember, we just talked about the Cretans at the place where Titus was, and they were referred to as lazy people. <laughs> Some of them were lazy. Well, there's nothing good that comes with being lazy, is there? there are individuals who we are, are, are know of that are always looking for someone to do something for them or looking for a handout, um, that doesn't end well for them, and God's not going to reward that behavior by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Scripture says those who, uh, in order to eat, you've got to work. And at the end of the day, we have to put in the time. We have to put in the time and the effort to make sure that we're doing what we can to take care of ourselves and our family, right? I mean, that's very important for us to do. And then verse 26, some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. Now, that's a contrast that we're looking at here. People who are always looking for more, looking, they're not satisfied that means they're not going to do anything that's charitable for anyone else. It's all about them. All about me, me, me is the attitude of those individuals who are looking for more. But the godly, it's in their nature and in their character to be generous and to be charitable. You know, the United States has the reputation of being one of the, the probably the most charitable nation in the world uh, when it comes to giving to causes or helping people in need. And at the end of the day, that's the type of uh, people that we, uh, as believers, should be, too. We should be ready to give um, where it is necessary to give. If there are people who are in need, if they need food, if they need shelter, if they need clothing. We just had um, major storms um, through here uh, earlier this month, and it was, a, it was a terrible situation for a lot of people who had lost their power for up to almost a week. So all their food was uh, spoiled. And, and so it should be in the nature of uh, those of us who have the ability to do so, to help others who are in need. Groceries are very expensive today. It's not a big, it's not a small expense now to stock up your grocery, uh, stock up your, uh, your pantry with groceries and also put uh, food in the refrigerator. It's hundreds of dollars of, of expense. And we need to be considerate and consider other people who may be less fortunate than us or maybe in need if we have the means to help them out then we are the ones ready to give the godly love to give they don't consider it a grudge at all to do so they do so because it's necessary and i want everyone to consider that that's exactly how we should be i won't expect much from people who are stingy but i do expect a lot from those of us who have the means to help others and i'm thankful that we have the ability to give and share with others Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we spent in your word. Bless this time, Lord, and keep us. And we give you praise for how you teach us and encourage us with your presence and your word. 
We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us for today's 15-minute devotional program. It took 30 minutes, but we appreciate you joining us and staying with us for this amount of time. God bless you and take care of yourselves. We'll see you around the corner, and we'll see you next time.